In the brief span of time since Elliot Roger murdered six people in cold blood in what he called his Day of Retribution, the internet has been rife with people claiming to have the answer to the question we ask after every mass murder in America. That simple one-word question, why? Because of Elliot Rogers' blatant misogyny and sense of entitlement to women's affections, the loudest voice attempting to answer this question is coming from the radical feminists of Tumblr and Twitter. Let's take a look at some of their comments. Porn teaches men that they are gods. Pop culture teaches men that the epitome of success is to be surrounded by naked women fawning over you. Prostitution exists because we, as a culture, very much believe that women exist to pleasure men. We tell women that they have to work in a marriage to keep their men happy, to keep them from straying. Buy sexy lingerie, try threesomes, try anal, perform every porn fantasy he has. He needs it. He deserves it. It is your job. We can continue to skirt around these truths that the sex industry and our patriarchal culture breed men like Roger, but expect more violence, more deaths, more rape, and more abuse. Our world is rife with Elliot Rogers. We create them every day. They aren't going anywhere. Was Elliot Roger created by porn and pop culture? Did he kill because he wasn't able to live his wild sexual fantasies, which society conditioned him to think he deserved by virtue of his mere existence as a male? Is the world rife with people who think exactly as Elliot does? Could the answer be so simple? Let's take a look at another comment. Man, I hate women. Man, I'm going to kill women because I hate them. Man kills women. Society. There must have been other factors. Hashtag yes all women. The yes all women tag has been trending every day since Roger committed his murders. It's a tag wherein feminists present the claim that they speak for all women, and that all women are subject to the sort of male entitlement displayed in Elliot Rogers' writings, videos, and most gruesomely in his actions. And this post seems to indicate a belief that Elliot Rogers killed his targets out of sheer misogyny, and that society is foolish for looking into other factors. The idea that Roger acted out of mental illness is particularly maligned, as in the next two comments. Another white boy with a gun. Another mental illness. I wonder why the UCSB shooter has been labeled troubled, a madman, and mentally ill by most every mainstream media outlet rather than the raging misogynist he truly is, something he so willingly makes evident by his own words. I wonder. When I suggested on my own Tumblr that I believed Elliot Roger was suffering from some form of mental illness, I received several messages from feminists claiming that I was using the concept of mental illness to downplay Elliot's misogyny or even excuse his behavior. Many feminists have also started labeling Elliot a men's rights activist. We don't know if Elliot Roger was mentally ill. We don't know if he was a madman. We do know that he was desperately lonely and unhappy, and the men's rights movement convinced him that his loneliness and unhappiness was intentionally caused by women. Because this is what the men's right movement does. It spreads misogyny, it spreads violence, and most of all, it spreads a sense of entitlement towards women's bodies. Pretending that this is a rare act perpetrated by a crazy person is disingenuous and also does nothing to address the threat of violence that women face every day. We can't just write this one off. We need to talk about all the fucked up parts of our culture, especially the movements that teach men that they have the right to dominate and intimidate and violate women that led to this. And we need to change things, because if we don't, I guarantee this will happen again, and again, and again. Was Elliot Roger part of the men's rights movement? Did they fill his head with misogyny and violence? Do men's rights groups teach that men have the right to dominate and intimidate women? 
Many feminists are now calling for men's rights organizations to be classified as hate groups on this very basis. Was Elliot Roger a product of his culture? Did his sense of entitlement stem from being born and raised in a society that continuously sent him the message that he, as a male, was entitled to women's bodies? For the answers, let's consult the 141-page manifesto that Roger wrote prior to his attack and subsequent death. By nature, I am a very jealous person, and at the age of nine, my jealous nature sprung to the surface. During playdates with James, sometimes he would have other friends over as well, and I would feel very jealous and upset that he paid more attention to them. Feeling left out, I would find a quiet corner and start crying. My mother and Kim were very understanding and did the best they could to console me. On the rare occurrence that my mother would have Maddie or Mo over for dinner, or if we would go to visit them at their house, Maddie often played with my little sister Georgia instead of me, and this too made me jealous. I remember all the times I cried when this happened. Jealousy and envy. Those two feelings would dominate my entire life and bring me immense pain. The feelings of jealousy I felt at nine years old were frustrating, but they were nothing compared to how I would feel once I hit puberty and have to watch girls choosing other boys over me. Any problem I had at nine years old was nirvana compared to what I was doomed to face. Elliot was highly jealous by his very nature. He craved attention and praise. His manifesto is full of longing for one thing above all else. Sex? Superficially. Ultimately, it was validation of his worth from other human beings and contempt for both those who denied it to him and those who got it in lieu of him. This next excerpt comes from when he was 14. I started to masturbate on a regular basis. At first, I did it by rubbing my penis on my bed, but it eventually escalated to looking at pictures of girls online while rubbing my penis against my pants, fantasizing about doing sexual things with them. I didn't know how to access any porn sites, so I would just browse regular websites until I found a picture of a hot girl to masturbate to. I developed a very high sex drive, and it would always remain like this. This was the start of hell for me. Going through puberty utterly doomed my existence. It condemned me to live a life of suffering and unfulfilled desire. Even at that young age, I felt depressed because I wanted sex, yet I felt unworthy of it. I didn't think I was ever going to experience sex in reality, and I was right. I never did. I was finally interested in girls, but there was no way I could ever get them. And so my starvation began. The boys in my grade talked about sex a lot. Some of them even told me they had had sex with their girlfriends. This was the most devastating and traumatizing thing I've ever heard in my life. Boys having sex at my age of 14? I couldn't fathom it. How is it that they were able to have such intimate and pleasurable experiences with girls while I could only fantasize about it? I frequently started asking myself, This was an all-boys school. How in the hell were these boys even able to meet girls to have sex with, I wondered. I hoped they were lying. I hoped against all hope. Hearing that really shook me to the core. Words cannot describe how much hatred and envy I felt for those boys. The hatred would only fester the more I suffered my sexual starvation. I was too scared to tell anyone about it, and I hid it well for a time. It seems that the idea that porn created his need for sex is false. Although he had once been subjected to porn by a friend at this point, he was too naive and sheltered to locate it on his own. It wasn't porn that was stroking his rabid urge for sex. It was his normal 14-year-old boy hormones and the supposed sexual conquest of his peers. He wanted the validation and pleasure of sex, and it outraged him that others were getting it, or at least claiming to, and he wasn't. The pattern repeats throughout his manifesto. Hatred of women for not being interested in him. Hatred of men for garnering more interest than him. These feelings were exacerbated by bullying incidents such as this one. I was completely and utterly alone. No one knew me or extended a hand to help me. I was an innocent, scared little boy trapped in a jungle full of malicious predators and I was shown no mercy. 
Some boys randomly push me against the lockers as they walk past me in the hall. One boy who was tall and had blonde hair called me a loser right in front of his girlfriends. Yes, he had girls with him, pretty girls. And they didn't seem to mind that he was such an evil bastard. In fact, I bet they liked him for it. This is how girls are, and I was starting to realize it. This was what truly opened my eyes to how brutal the world is. The most meanest and depraved of men come out on top, and women flock to these men. Their evil acts are rewarded by women, while the good, decent men are laughed at. It is sick, twisted, and wrong in every way. I hated these girls even more than the bullies because of this. The sheer cruelty of the world around me was so intense that I will never recover from my mental scars. Any experience I had before never traumatized me as much as this. We are seeing a picture here of a boy shaped not by pop culture and pornography, but by his interactions with his peers. He has a strong sense of sexual curiosity, like most hormonally normal teenage boys, but no girls reciprocate his interest. Meanwhile, the very boys who bully him and demean him are generating interest. To see his tormentors getting what he desires for himself is too much for him in his infinite sense of jealousy and entitlement. The sad thing is, he never describes any attempt to actually talk to or connect with girls. He escapes instead into World of Warcraft and other video games. But only occasionally does pop culture seem to be a factor in his derangement, such as in the following excerpt. At Father's house, we watched the movie Alpha Dog after dinner one night. This movie depicts a lot of teenagers and young people partying and having sex with beautiful girls, living the life I've desired for so long. The main character is a 15-year-old kid who has sex with two hot girls in a swimming pool. I was so envious that I delighted in his death at the end. I remember thinking I would rather live his life than mine, even though he died. He had sex, and I didn't. The movie deeply affected me emotionally, and I would think about it for some time afterwards. Such incidents seem to be something that play upon his existing feelings of inadequacy and resentment. To say that instances like this are the genesis of his derangement doesn't really jive with the other material in the manifesto. The ingredients to make this killer were not porn and a popular culture of male entitlement. They were his innate sense of jealousy, his feelings of inadequacy, and his own sex drive. In other words, everything that made him what he is was in him to begin with. The world did exacerbate his issues, but how do we create a world where bullies don't pick on awkward kids? How do we create a world where boys don't get jealous of what other boys are doing? How do we create a world where a boy doesn't resent that he's not getting the sex that he desires. How do we amend human nature itself? At age 17, his psychology takes an odd turn. He begins to not only desire sex, but resent sex. Resent the power that sex holds over him. One day I found some posts on the internet about teenagers having sex, and I was once again reminded of the life I had been denied. I felt that no girl would ever want to have sex with me, and I developed extreme feelings of envy, hatred, and anger towards anyone who has a sex life. I saw them as the enemy. I felt condemned to live a life of lonely celibacy while other boys were allowed to experience the pleasures of sex, all because girls didn't want me. I felt inferior and undesirable. This time, however, I couldn't stand by and accept such an injustice anymore. I refused to continue hiding away from the world and forgetting about all the insults it dealt to me. I began to have fantasies of becoming very powerful and stopping everyone from having sex. I wanted to take sex away from them, just like they took it away from me. I saw sex as an evil and barbaric act all because I was unable to have it. This was the major turning point. My anger made me stronger inside. This was when I formed my ideas that sex should be outlawed. It is the only way to make the world a fair and just place. If I can't have it, I will destroy it. 
That's the conclusion I came to, right then and there. I spent more time studying the world, seeing the world for the horrible, unfair place it is. I then had the revelation that just because I was condemned to suffer a life of loneliness and rejection doesn't mean I am insignificant. I have an exceptionally high level of intelligence. I see the world differently than anyone else. Because of all the injustices I went through and the worldview I developed because of them, I must be destined for greatness. I must be destined to change the world, to shape it into an image that suits me. I'd like to point out that this thought process is veering ever more away from the typical male. Many young boys with high sex drives are despondent when they don't garner the level of sexual attention that they want. Very few, if any of them, escape into fantasies about destroying sex itself, denying it to everyone else out of spite. This is bordering on mental illness. But by the conclusion of the manifesto, Eliot's mental illness is beyond denial. Would a sane person ever, ever write something like this? I am not part of the human race. Humanity has rejected me. The females of the human species have never wanted to mate with me, so how could I possibly consider myself part of humanity? Humanity has never accepted me among them, and now I know why. I am more than human. I am superior to them all. I am Elliot Roger, magnificent, glorious, supreme, eminent, divine. I am the closest thing there is to a living God. Humanity is a disgusting, depraved, and evil species. It is my purpose to punish them all. I will purify the world of everything that is wrong with it. On the day of retribution, I will truly be a powerful God, punishing everyone I deem to be impure and depraved. Would a sane person ever believe something like this? Sex is by far the most evil concept in existence. The fact that life itself exists through sex just proves that life is flawed. The act of sex gives human beings a tremendous amount of pleasure, pleasure they don't deserve. No one deserves to experience so much pleasure, especially since some humans get to experience it while some are denied it. When a man has sex with a beautiful woman, he probably feels like he is in heaven. But the world is not supposed to be heaven. For some humans to actually be able to feel such heights of heavenly pleasure is selfish and hedonistic. These are the ravings of a narcissist, consumed by jealousy, driven by a massive ego, and writhing with anger that his greatness is not recognized by his male peers and his desired female conquests. The feminists are wrong when they claim that mental illness played no part in this tragedy. But they're right when they point out that his raging misogyny is a huge factor. And for the misguided people out there that say he wasn't a misogynist because he killed more men than women, listen to this. The ultimate evil behind sexuality is the human female. They are the main instigators of sex. They control which men get it and which men don't. Women are flawed creatures, and my mistreatment at their hands has made me realize this sad truth. There is something very twisted and wrong with the way their brains are wired. They think like beasts, and in truth, they are beasts. Women are incapable of having morals or thinking rationally. They are completely controlled by their depraved emotions and vile sexual impulses. Because of this, the men who do get to experience the pleasure of sex and the privilege of breeding are the men who women are sexually attracted to. The stupid, degenerate, obnoxious men. I have observed this all my life. The most beautiful of women choose to mate with the most brutal of men, instead of magnificent gentlemen like myself. Women should not have the right to choose who to mate and breed with. 
The decision should be made for them by rational men of intelligence. If women continue to have rights, they will only hinder the advancement of the human race by breeding with degenerate men and creating stupid, degenerate offspring. This will cause humanity to become even more depraved with each generation. Women have more power in human society than they deserve, all because of sex. There is no creature more evil and depraved than a human female. Women are like a plague. They don't deserve any rights. Their wickedness must be contained in order to prevent future generations from falling to degeneracy. Women are vicious, evil, barbaric animals, and they need to be treated as such. He goes on to describe a world in which he is the dictator. He says that he would round up all women into concentration camps where he could watch them starve to death from a tower. Only a few women would be kept alive, and only for breeding purposes. Oddly, he doesn't want to mate with them himself, nor does he want other men to do so. He wishes for them to be artificially inseminated. His ultimate goal is to erase sex from human psychology. Future generations of men would be oblivious to these remaining women's existence, and that is for the best. If a man grows up without knowing of the existence of women, there will be no desire for sex. Sexuality will completely cease to exist. Love will cease to exist. There will no longer be any imprint of such concepts in the human psyche. It is the only way to purify the world. Aside from being completely scientifically unsound, this mentality is truly disgusting and evil. But what's also disgusting and evil is that feminists are trying to represent these views as the views of the men's rights movement. I am not a men's rights activist, and I find their worldview to be as flawed as feminism. But I must defend them against this ludicrously unfair attack. The Daily Kos was the first to report that Elliot Roger was a men's rights activist. Their evidence is that he belonged to an anti-pickup artist forum where many men go to attack the concept of uh, pickup artist systems as exploiting men out of their money. And misogyny is rampant in both the pickup artist and anti-pickup artist communities. But pickup artists and men's rights activists are not the same thing, as men's rights activist Janet Bloomfield points out in her May 25th article, Murderer kills six, four men and two women, cause misogyny. While it is clear to me that nothing more than ignorance and prejudice is informing these writers about the MHRM and MRAs, I wonder how the association between PUA and MHRM came to be, because I came to MHRM out of concern for the legal and social equality of men and women, and not out of bitterness born from dating and interacting. I know very, very little about the PUA community. I have encountered Chateau Hartitsti, and have even written posts pointing out that some of his material is terribly mistaken, but I do not recall ever encountering any serious discussion of political and social issues that affect men and boys on his website. And the most poignant irony for me is that Elliot was a member of an anti-PUA site, so not even part of the PUA community at all. His fantasies included killing both men and women, but the focus appears to be stubbornly on how much he hated women. He killed more men than women, and yet the focus is stubbornly on the female victims. The only conclusion I can come to is that this is political grandstanding, with no evidence or facts to support the assertion that Elliot was a member of any MHRM communities. In a desperate attempt to paint the MHRM as violent and hateful, prominent media feminists are ignoring evidence and body counts to create an association between the desire for social equality and murderous rampages. I don't agree with much of her article, but on this particular point, I think she's spot on. Even if Elliot Roger were an MRA, his actions would not prove that the entire movement was violent or a hate group. 
Valerie Solanas, perhaps the most famous radical feminist of all time, shot and intended to kill Andy Warhol, the famous artist. Do we claim that all feminists are violent or that feminism itself breeds violence because of this? No. Although perhaps we should be concerned, kill all men is a popular feminist hashtag on Twitter, and a post supporting male genocide was recently quite popular on Tumblr. When such violent rhetoric is called out, feminists like Ian Miles Chong claim that they're just women venting their anger towards a society that has rendered them powerless to do anything else. The notion that females are powerless in Western society is laughable to the extreme, but even if they were powerless, how does that excuse the use of violent rhetoric? How do we know there isn't a female equivalent of Elliot Roger out there seething with jealousy, resentment, and anger? How do we know that such a person won't be egged on by such violent rhetoric? We don't, of course. Ultimately, however, we can't blame society for mass murders. After all, they're highly isolated incidents. Last year in America, there were 16 mass shootings. That's it, with 78 victims total. That's an insignificant number. In 2012, there were about 15,000 murders in the U.S. I don't know how many there were in 2013, but it's probably about the same. So mass murders account for a very, very small percentage of all murders, a tiny fraction of a percent. If culture was truly the culprit, then these events would be far more common and they would share more in common in terms of their motives. The fact is that when we ask ourselves, why did six people die at the hands of Elliot Roger on what he called his day of retribution? The answer might be simply that he was born that way. His jealousy was inborn, his sex drive was innate, his parents did everything they could to help him, including getting him shrinks and even calling the authorities to report his aberrant behaviors. Everything that happened to him in his life, the bullying, the unfulfilled sexual desire, those are all common experiences for boys growing up anywhere. We will never know the full extent of what convergence of factors made this man kill. His misogyny, his jealousy, his irrational hatred of sex, his narcissism, his power fantasies, his experiences. What is the exact recipe for a mass murderer? I don't know. Anyone who claims to know is a liar with a hidden agenda. I'm the Amazing Atheist. Peace the fuck out.